Oh my god. Oh my god. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Artifact number 36. I am joined by Jessica Schneider. She's a poet, critic, and novelist, and she also writes for the automachination.com website. Um, she recently released this book, Ekphrasm, right? It's based on French painters, right? Uh, some people watching this video might already know that ekphrastic poetry refers to poetry that is done uh, I don't want to say in the service of visual art, right? But it's done, let's say, based on a painting. One thing that uh, her husband, Dan Schneider, often points out is that a lot of painting poetry, let's call it, uh, tends to just sort of uh, uh, peter out in the sense that, you know, maybe it just simply recaps what's going on in a painting, which, I mean, it's not very interesting, right? I mean, if you could just look at a painting, uh, uh, why mm -hmm. do you simply need a description of what's on there? If you're going to actually write about it, you're going to have to do something separate from what's going on on the canvas, right? There needs to be some kind of twist. There needs to be some kind of new perspective. And thankfully, the book ha has a lot of this. And, um, of course, right, ekphrasm, right? Not only is it uh, uh, calling to term, uh, calling to mind that terminology, it also should be uh, calling to mind the word orgasm. So if you picked up on that, maybe you could clean yourself off for a couple of minutes, come back to this show. Um, but actually, as an icebreaker, I, I actually want to show um, maybe like a couple of like passive aggressive emails that I got from Jessica in reference to this show. Um, what? Uh, oh, well, okay. As an icebreaker, okay, we just want to make sure that that people stay with us a little bit. So when I when I give my notes, right, for any kind of show, they're very very long and detailed. I want people to know exactly what we're this talking wasn't... about. What? This wasn't passive aggressive. All right, fine. It was just Don't directly. It was just Don't... directly aggressive. She 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 writes quote you kind of go overkill on the notes I don't even <laughs> wait 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 this is even better I don't even look at them to be honest okay all right so uh, basically the show almost didn't happen because of this email alone but I think maybe my the favorite part of this email which came um, uh, afterwards when she finally uh, agreed to to send some notes over um, she asked me wait did you order the book recently this month. She was casting doubt that this book, right, would be in my hands, despite the fact that now I own the physical copy and the digital edition. Um, you know, I, I, I deal with so much bullshit in preparation for these uh, 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 shows, and not the least of it comes from the participants themselves. So anyway, let, let's move on to uh, uh, the show proper. So uh, I guess that the first thing is that uh, when I was watching uh, the show that you did with Ethan Pinch, right, that's of the new house, I'm going to put a link to that show. You you did a show with him about a year ago or so uh, mm -hmm. on this book. Um, one thing that uh, you mentioned was that, you know, this is kind of like within the theme of uh, French painting. This is within the theme of like Impressionism. But at the same time, like I, I definitely got the sense uh, reading the poems here uh you, you could have gone many different directions. And in fact, you do. I, I think one of the best things about the book uh, in the kind of like more, I guess, meta category of writing is, is in the fact that uh, there's a lot going on that's not merely just painting, right? There's a character here by the name of Landon, right, that makes several appearances as a kind of, uh, I don't want to say a controlling figure. Maybe that's kind of overstating things a little bit. But definitely a, a mysterious figure that, uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, by the name and, and other uh, features of the writing seems to be a male. In other situations, it almost seems like it could be a, a woman. Um, I'll, maybe I'll talk about that poem in particular. I immediately thought, actually, before even watching the show with Ethan, uh, I was like, is, is this character supposed to be Ethan Pinch? Um, and then in the show, it turns out that, uh, I guess that was, uh, at least somewhat in your mind. Uh, so, okay. So we have like a character that's kind of popping in and out. Uh, you have, uh, poems here that really don't mention, uh, painting in a very direct way. Like, for example, you have a, a poetry based on the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine last year going into this year, right? We're going to be talking about, uh, the poem that you wrote on Mariupol, for instance, um, uh, mm -hmm. You could you could have easily thrown in you know post impressionist painters. You could have easily thrown in 
uh, uh, people even from you know the 21st century. And in fact, you you, mm -hmm. you have like you have Vivian Meyer, who was a photographer from the 20th century. So there's a lot that's going on here that keeps it from being dull and just like some endless variation of one fucking thing, right? Because that's mm -hmm. kind of like the problem, right? With a lot of this kind of a, a poetry, it's either endless repetition of things that you could already see with your eyes. Um, or, yeah. you know, there, 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 there's nothing here to really break the monotony. So maybe we mm -hmm. could start with that and do a little commentary there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I definitely wrote with what came to me. I it definitely uh, want, always want to have an organic feel within any collection. And so the subtitle is Poems on French Painters, Paintings, and Natures. And, you know, at the time I was writing it, I was learning more about uh, the French painting and, and, um, talking to Ethan a lot. And so I was getting, uh, hearing a lot of his perspective on Cezanne and all these others. And, uh, as for which ones I chose, I really just went with what hit me at the moment. And, and then I note in the introduction that I noticed the theme was a lot of it, uh, dealing with people who, uh, artists who were overlooked in some, t in some way in their life. So that's why you see someone like, a. Hilma off Clinton, you see Vivian Meyer, and in, in some way or another, they were all overlooked the way, say, say you know, uh, Cezanne was and the others. And, and um, so, uh, but I did try to keep it just to French paintings. And then, you know, again, going outside for the nature ideas and uh, just trying to have them all have a type of synergy. And that was really what was m most important. To me, and I wouldn't say you know the the character um, that I that I um, inserted in into there. I mean, he was somewhat inspired by Ethan, but I mean, like as Ethan said, you know, there's quite a bit of me in him, and I do like your observation that you say sometimes he could be a woman, and you don't really know, and it doesn't really matter. But that's uh oh, got a cat. Um, that's when you have you know you look at these painting what you're saying with the paintings and you read some boring poems about the paintings and it's just a description and there's nothing deeper going on. There's nothing. And so I try to, with each painting or whatever, um, not just have, you know, something else is good. There's some other observation. I'm not just describing what else could there be. Could it be the person looking at it? Could it be some imbuement? So like you said, you bring up the, uh, the poem, um, uh, Mario Pole that I wrote was actually, I started it, and I mentioned this in the essay, was actually supposed to be a poem based on the cover here, La Forêt. And so I remember writing the poem, and it's an example of where you have to really just go where your, where your insight goes, because I was trying to write this poem on this painting, and it was just something limp about it. It just wasn't, it was like kind of dull, or I don't know, it just wasn't, I didn't have an in. I go, I don't know what I'm thinking about because I kept thinking about maybe someone is hiding in this forest, like what's going on. And then at the time was the actual invasion was going on. So it was impossible not to just bring that in. That's just what happened. It wasn't like I sat here and planned it. It was just what was going on in current events. So I merged the two. So uh, that's an example so, where so, you just so, have so to kind of go. So when you started the Mariupol poem, that was not during the invasion that it just came it, after? no. No, no, it was that was was going on at the time okay, in the right. news. But I had started it not with the intention of writing that. I was trying to write a poem on this painting, and then I couldn't. And that's why it became the cover. <laughs> so I was like, okay, oh, I'll see. do it justice in some way. And so I just went with where the ideas took me, and that's what I listened to was going on what was going on in Ukraine at the time. So again, that was just an example of like you just kind of have to go where your ideas take you. You can't always plan it. Um, and it's okay. You know, then you just got to, you know, if, if you're like, oh, I really wanted to write about this, but I ended up being about that. Then you just kind of move on and you're like, okay, well, I can write about that at another time. Um, may you know? Maybe we could start uh, with, um, I, I think, one of the strongest poems in the collection on uh, uh, I I its title, Manet's uh, Mirror, right? And it's based on mm. uh, the famous Manet uh, uh, um, painting of basically the bartender. And you see uh, either Manet or someone based on him or just some other figure, right? We don't know, you know, it's sort of diegetically within that universe uh, what it's supposed to be, but we could just say um, uh, the painter just for the sake of argument. Um, maybe uh, we could look at that painting together. And as we're doing that, uh, mm -hmm. you could read the poem for us, right? Because I want people okay. to sort of get a sense of how, you know, how the author herself might okay. do um, this. 
Yeah. And by the way, I appreciate the work you put into it. And and when I was saying I don't read, I was referring to you would have long texts on the Terminators. Yeah. Well, <laughs> honestly, it's, it's just it's just to make sure that you know when I'm when I'm when I'm doing uh, the shows, it's just that I could have like a thousand different thoughts, and uh, it's how person I am. I just want to make sure I could stuff everything no. into a show, which is why these shows often go as long as they do. But anyway, um, mm-hmm. here so here's the uh, uh, painting and um, okay. Shall I yes. read it then? Yeah, then we could all observe and listen. Okay. Manet's mirror. Wearily, distractedly, center of canvas. The woman amid expression is simply ennui. A bar at the Folie Berger, her tall words bespeak nothing in particular. Bottles, fruit, flowers, an accompanying color. Her backwards head. Manet's name upon a bottle. We know the audience, ever present, as some mechanical animal. The flowers wilt her gaze. Why are we never enough? The plurality of wounds manifests the many faces we see beneath the silver sleeve. This painting is she, not unlike the daguerreotype of some soldier from another reign, his uniform non pareil Discover her in crowds in winter, center of picture. Marble counter and cluttered liquor rose amid its center, fragile, vulnerable, her largeness ephemeral. She is perishable, displaced as the mirror behind her, moving about as a poem one has not read for many years. Name the day, tavern, conversation, tired of casual questions, small chatter. Landon moves similarly on downward wings. Right. So just to, uh, talk about some of the things that I noticed both in the painting and also uh, in the poem uh, as you were uh, reading it, right? So, um, and also, again, just to serve as a contrast between maybe what other people might do, right, when they're doing uh, writing on, uh, on on painting, right, or, or of a similar kind of nature. So the first line, wearily, distractedly, center of canvas, right? So, um we're characterizing her face, right? We're characterizing uh, uh, maybe uh, what she's doing, how she feels in that situation. Uh, there might be some subjectivity there, right? Some people mm-hmm. might argue about uh, uh, the specifics of this or that expression, but I, I would personally agree with this kind of characterization, right? And just kind of like, you know, from the get-go, right? You could sort of say right away that, oh, look, um, here we have a, a take that is ready, perhaps maybe a little bit subjective, right? It's not merely a recap of what's in the painting, right? But we mm-hmm. are, you know, we are, we, we are sort of, uh, from the very beginning, right? Centering her, uh, mm-hmm. and she kind of looks like she's almost looking at you in a way that's kind of through you, almost like she's spacing out a little bit. Like maybe if you're the customer, she's like, okay, you know what I mean? Like maybe she's been doing this mm-hmm. for several hours and she's tired. And then right. I've al- I also have heard, however, um, not to go too much on the art, but I've heard arguments that that's not the mirror, that that's maybe another person in the back because it wouldn't line up and stuff like I've heard that argument as well. But, you know, we'll take it as w- for what it is. Well, it's an interpretation. It- yeah, even so, in those kinds of situations, right? Let's say that in a kind of technical uh, sense, like it wouldn't uh, totally make sense. Um, mm-hmm. The the fact is, uh, you know, you can credibly make arguments for either of those two. I think more so for this. This is a mirror, but the fact that you can make another kind of argument does not a takeaway from the fact that you could also make this argument that it isn't mm-hmm. th- in fact a mirror right um and you know I, I think that's the thing that most people would go with but anyway in, in the middle of the poem right there's this uh a line that i want to uh focus on uh it's the flowers wilt her and then there's mm-hmm. a line break gaze right um mm-hmm. so i mean that's an example of uh an enjambment that's very well done right uh you have this mm-hmm. idea that uh, flowers wilting it could be a little bit of a trite image right but specifically mm-hmm. it's flowers that are wilting her right um and it's not just wilting her it's kind of like oh look this you know faded you know this faded uh, rose on a, on a cheek right to use like a shakespearean cliche right uh-huh. it's the flowers wilt her gaze now as we go on 
why are we never line break enough, right? And that's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, another good use of enjambment, because if we're sort of staying from the interpretation that this is a woman that is kind of tired, I mean, immediately when I see this, like as a man, right, you know, picking mm -hmm. up cues from a woman, right, she looks uh, pretty uninterested in uh, whatever this guy has to say. Um, <laughs> and uh, she might very well be thinking, all right, so this guy might be looking at me in a very kind of hungry way. Uh, maybe at that point, she simply wants to be the bartender, right? Meaning her mm -hmm. object, uh, her objective there is to simply, you know, fulfill someone's orders and not necessarily, I mean, I understand that if you're going to be like a, a female bartender, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't want to say that part of the job is like, you know, men look at you, but you're going to be around drunk fucking men, right? And this is, you know, this is simply mm -hmm. a, a situation that you're going to encounter, um, but she might, you know, very well in that situation be thinking, you know, why are we never enough, mm -hmm. right? Like, why can't we simply, you know, be mm -hmm. as we are, do the job? Why do we have to be, you know, uh, some kind of object in any kind of way, right? It doesn't have to be necessarily sexual, but just like an object, uh, uh, meaning like not something of your own use, but a use for someone else, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, th this is something that often would not be done uh, in, uh, in, in poetry of this nature. Um, and even later, right, there's this still kind of this like a little bit of an interplay with perhaps some of this like sexual reading where near the end of the poem, you have, uh, uh the following line, um, name the day tavern conversation, tired of casual line break questions, small chatter, right? Casual, you know, almost as if, mm -hmm. you know, like a casual sex or something, right? Tired of this, tired of that. But here, right, it's not even, you know, getting to the route of that. Here, it's even less exciting, right? It's just this casual, oblique, pointless, chit, you know, chit chat that yeah. kind of goes nowhere that she has to also deal with for, for much mm -hmm. of her life. Um, anyway, that's about what I have to say about yeah. what, uh, and then this. And then it ties, ties back to, the, like, the landing character. And you got to remember, the landing character is a painter himself. So it's about, you know, he's a stand-in, like, you know, so he he also it's imbued that he also kind of feels similarly about, you know, mm -hmm. someone that, say, is a painter and trying to get maybe he's getting his work. No, we don't we don't know necessarily. But but that's an example of where, you know, it's a poem. And I took more than what you're just seeing. I I put some kind of possible thinking she what might what might she be feeling what might she be thinking and that's more than just you know a woman at a stand and she looks at you and blah 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 and behind her blah, blah, you know just a blanket you know boring description that's no fun mm -hmm. so exactly so uh yeah and and, and yeah like uh, and then i should have mentioned that th th this introduction of um uh well it's not landon does appear i believe earlier in the text as well but just this kind of idea, right, that we're going mm -hmm. to sort of break apart the sort of universe uh, of the painting, right? We're going to take this out of the 1800s. And now, you know, perhaps that's another thing that like, we don't exactly know what the time period is. Uh, there's some evidence that Landon is a, you know, contemporary of us. Mm -hmm. uh, it mm -hmm. could be, you know, uh, uh, there's some pieces where it seems like he's almost like a figure from the uh 20th century so uh who knows but you know that's well, he not goes so and important. he gets his vaccine in one day so he, yeah. he get he has a poem where well again i was writing about stuff that was was happening at the time too because i believe i started this in like march 2021 I, I it took me like 14 months i wrote it over the course of 14 months that wasn't the only thing i was writing yeah. a lot of reviews during that time but yeah um yeah, that's that's where like because I think you know I mentioned I wanted to sort of think about oh should I do a novel blah blah and I was like no I just wasn't being pulled there so I I, I went where I was pulled and you know so I was I was pleased with with uh, where I went and I thought too if I follow up with a further connect collection I'd like to do more uh, Manet paintings maybe make him the star because. Um, he has so many good ones, and especially when I look at great ones, I should say, not uh, when you the essay that Ethan did write on um, Manet, which is all those paintings, and there's so much complexity there. Yeah, yeah. So, like, like I said, like bringing a Landon back at the very end, right? Landon moves similarly on downward wings, right? Um, there's almost a little bit of a Wallace Stevens, right? Yep, sort yep. of. Oh, oh, yeah. Was that the reference that you said to well, Wallace? Well, the Stevens? thing is. 
it, it was a little from, su- from a Sunday little... morning, right? The the birds on the downward yes. lines, yeah, yeah. Well, well, it was. I remember I missed. I I had had a line of his in my head, and then I misremembered it, and then so I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I like my misremembering. So yeah, I I I, 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 I love that. I love that after reading. Uh, if you misremember a line, you're like, oh fuck, I now I could use this, right? Yes, now, yeah. Now now I'm not a plagiarist. Now I could use it because <laughs> I remembered my own way. I love when that happens. That you know that happens all the time. So. Um, yeah. and w- which is why, by the way, you know, uh, uh, people might be skeptical of this idea of like memorizing poetry or memorizing favorite paragraphs or prose. But honestly, do it because eventually, whatever that you memorize, you're going to start to forget. And eventually, mm-hmm. that means if you have an artistic inclination, you're going to misremember your way into your own shit, right? Like, and, mm-hmm. and that's that that's pretty good. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and just like and just kind of like think about the sound, yeah. This kind of the, this uh, introduction here of Landon and elsewhere. I mean, it really does enrich the like. I'm just imagining the book without Landon. There would definitely be much more of a feeling of monotony, even if like the uh, subject matter were not all, let's say, French painters, because it's not. But the you know the the uh, entry of this character is uh, is pretty important, and it, it's a nice again, it's like a nice bridge between whatever this uh, uh, let's say more archaic world world is with um you know some stand in for uh, present day or you know maybe mm-hmm. a bit after uh, whatever this time period is so um mm-hmm. let, let let's move on to uh this here so this is a a famous uh oh yeah monet uh painting right of uh, uh Ma- yes. madame monet and her son right with the with the parasol um Maybe maybe you could tell me, Jessica, why specifically, uh, like, did you have an idea for a poem first, uh, or did you see this painting, decide to do something uh, about it? And if so, why why this painting in particular? I think a combination. I think it was the parasol and the whole idea of seeing the sunlight through the parasol in a way. And so it reminded me of a lot of imagery and film and how... Uh, you know, whether you get sun going through uh, um, leaves or whatever. So, like, I have a line in here. Some call it Paris through a parasol. So that can be read as Paris, the city, the culture, or it can be Paris, the, you, you're, you still, there's still some transparency um, in, through that, through that parasol. And because I, I think you can see it's like kind of a green-ish tone. But but I get the sense that you can see the bit of the sky possibly behind it. And I remember seeing a lot of paintings of um, I, I reference this image somewhere in the book about um, uh, seeing uh, um, you'd see like the sun through a, the flag of a ship. I've seen that mm-hmm. before. So it was a lot about just seeing seeing something trans go through something transparent. Um, Do you want to read the poem? Uh Okay, I can. I, I hope I, d- I don't miss. I'm probably going to mispronounce something. So please. By the way, be I'm gentle. asking. You, I'm asking you to read the poems here so that I don't mispronounce anything. <laughs> uh, now I'll look. Okay. Uh, no, because uh, listeners should know I have not gone through and read them. So this my la- my reading Manet's Mirror. I have not read that since you know for a while. So anyway, okay. So this poem's called What Monet Said. Unplain air are his words among color and figure. The rampant impression, the shades interior. Some call it Paris through a parasol, a cup of tea. The bridges of Argentile vision lives among the ongoing ennui, the pollen, the infection. Landon too awaits whilst the world rivals the occasion phantom. Red garden, tired green, we argue over how to breathe in plain air. Language loses verb. Monet's river borrowed. Uh, w- w- one thing that immediately uh, uh, comes on, right? So um, we have this idea, right? The rampant, and that's a line break impression, right? Obviously, there's a little bit of that, mm-hmm. you know, impressionism kind of a uh, reference. The fact that it's rampant, right? Uh, mm-hmm. All over the place. This is sort of like this ongoing thing going on uh, in a time period, but obviously it didn't start that way, right? First started at, uh, as a publicly perceived as a kind of joke, right? Then it becomes uh, this this thing that uh, takes on uh, its own sort of life. Um, the shades interior, right? That's also the shades mm-hmm. line mm-hmm. break interior. 
And this is also something not, uh, th- that people won't necessarily think about all that much, right? This idea of there being some sort of a internality, right, to a shadow, right? Uh, shadows mm-hmm. are normally thought of something that is external to something like some kind of figure or whatever. But here, right, a shadow being interesting uh, in and of itself, it having some sort of interior life, it has some sort of interior role, right? Mm-hmm. Um Later on, right, we have uh, this uh, uh, this idea of the pollen, the infection, right? And uh, it's also kind of uh, unexpected, right? There's also a line break a- after pollen, right? This idea that, yeah, I mean, he's going to capture, right, flowers, right? That's a, a mm-hmm, common sort mm-hmm. of impressionism theme, obviously, with the, you know, interplay of light and, and flowers, right? It seems very uh, not a lo- a logical and natural, Right. Um, but instead of being specifically referenced as the flowers, right, I thought it was a smart uh, decision to say pollen specifically, because when you you know say pollen, like the image that we would have now mm-hmm. is, you know, something floating th- through the air. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea of anything floating automatically to us now might have this association with you know, passage of both time and space, right? Impressionism specifically has this feeling of uh, not only just, you know, we're capturing space, but we are very much capturing time. If people watch our earlier artifact with me and Jill Parrish on Leonard Leonard Schlein's art and physics, right? One of the arguments that Leonard Schlein makes for uh, the greatness of art in general, but specifically for impressionism is, Right, the, this kind of idea that they are prefiguring some of the discoveries in the broader sciences, or just ways maybe of like looking at the world before they're actually articulated elsewhere in a more prosaic way, whether it's science or in some other fashion. Um, mm-hmm. And here, you know, pollen captures that in a way that's kind of modern. I don't know if there's any like talk of pollen or whatever in any kind of meaningful way uh, back then, but um, we would associate this with this, you know, passage uh, across yeah. space. Um, but also after the pollen, it's the infection, right? Uh, almost this idea, well, a, a couple of things, right? If you're specifically thinking about the 1800s and the sort of kind of, uh, maybe we could call it the golden age of diseases, right? You have on the one <laughs> hand, cities uh, coming to the fore in this kind of uh, extreme way for the first time, which brings you know, mass infections. It also brings obviously new discoveries uh, in controlling uh, uh, infections. But also just artistically, right? This idea of impressionism as being an infection in and of itself, right? This idea, this constant spread of an idea. Uh, was that, by the yeah, way, like some some of your own thinking as you were writing that here with these well, lines, or what? In some way, but you know, honestly, sometimes I just go for the most obvious because I was sitting there thinking, and I look at it, and I was thinking the pollen, the infection. I was actually thinking this. I probably have a lot of allergies. <laughs> just because you see the little, it looks like you can see the wind, things are going to be blowing in the air. And, 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 uh, that's the surface level. But again, you can interpret it deeper, deeper than that. But, um, that's, that's what, um, somewhat what I was thinking, uh, ha- arguing how to basically breathing, breathing in this, this air. Um, it looks like the painting is moving too. That's another thing. Yeah. When you look at it, you know, it's, it does, it definitely has a very, it doesn't look static in the least. You can just see like her dress is moving her. It looks like her hair is moving. It's almost like her hair is part of the cloud. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, I, I always thought that was uh, that, that blue around the face, right? This, uh, uh, it's almost as if it's like, um, you know, like this is wind, right? Uh, this mm-hmm. is wind encircling her. Like if you're, if you're going to paint, you know, wind outside of painting uh, shadows, right? Where Mm -hmm. long the shadows of the wind had rolled, green wheat was yielding to the change of sign. Beyond that, right? uh, If you want to capture it outside of shadow, maybe this is what it would look like. Yeah. Um, So uh, the next one up is on, uh, uh, it's it's a drawing of uh, Paul Cezanne's uh, son. Uh, Let me see, where are we? All right, yeah, here we are. So this is uh, Paul Cezanne's uh, uh, son. Uh, I believe this is the drawing that you were looking at? Yes. All right, normally I would zoom in for the viewers a little. By the way, if you're an audio podcast listener, you must be seething right now. You must have already had your orgasm and moved on. Um, But if you are watching this, maybe it would be a good idea, right, to uh, sort of keep your eyes peeled 
uh, as we are uh, going through the paintings. Um, so this drawing, I would I would zoom in, but at the same time, uh, for whatever reason, when I go to the site, the the picture itself disappears. So we're oh. gonna uh, we're just gonna watch it like this. Um, so w w what exactly was it uh, about this painting that made you, uh, or rather mm. this drawing that made you want to write about it? Well, it was interesting because when I was reading about Cezanne, he was rather a grouchy guy, but he really loved his son. So he had this very protective, you know, uh, endearing kind of quality that he, you know, he felt towards his his son. And um, I just, you know, I just thought it was a sweet little picture. Uh, uh, you know, a young Paul asleep. His son is also Paul. And apparently I think that Paul also has a son named Paul. So like, I think Paul, 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 there's all these Pauls. <laughs> okay uh let me let me actually read uh, the poem myself right to break up some of that monotony right okay. we're, gonna, we're gonna stay with the land and theme a little bit here uh so it's titled a young paul asleep for Cezanne's son perhaps the boy beneath his elder reef when carved into gentle slumber wills this nocturne as tender as his father the painter who occasions the day-lit fields under his dark hat and brooding. He is, aside the full fallen moon, wherein this star-laden pillow upholds his child's head, faithfully through the noon, intrusive window, loud bird, the grave amongst most hills we expire. Young Paul, vulnerable seed, what childhood flesh lives as breathing, sleep and how the wild. Ellipses, right? That's just me saying ellipses, dot, 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 dot. Paul, right, is how it ends, mm -hmm. right? Its own mm -hmm. sort of standalone line. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, I guess the first thing I'll mention is that clearly there's a lot in this poem here that uh, is not even physically present, right, in any kind of way in the drawing, right? For instance, loud bird, right? There is no yeah. loud bird, right? This is simply your imagining, right? He's yep. in a room. Most likely there is a window somewhere in this room. And even if there isn't a window in this room, you know there is an outside world in this room by definition. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, you, you could, you know, guys, look, you don't have to be scared. You could throw some of those details in. That's going to be perfectly fine, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to do poetry of this nature. So maybe you could do a little bit of analysis of uh, your own writing here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's, it's interesting because like, like I said, he, he has a very tender feeling towards his son. But then I started then to think about, uh, then he go, as his father, the painter who occasions the daylit fields under his dark hat and brooding. So he's always, he's going out there. He went out in the fields and he's painting and then... Um, so it's the contrast. He's going out, he's painting, he's kind of frustrated because, you know, people don't admire his work or whatever. And then as a contrast, he has this, you know, tender kind of drawing of his son, um, you know, the the pillow upholding his, his, uh, his child's head and, you know, through the night and then, um, you know, faithfully he does it all night through the noon intrusive window, maybe the sun, the sun coming in or, or whatever. Um, the loud bird, uh, thing, things outside the it's, it's sort of like you get this kind of quiet moment, but outside when he goes out and paints, it's, you hear the birds, you hear more ruckus interaction. Um, so it's a contrast between, you know, lives as breathing sleep. And then as, as how the wild, again, that's what the outside is. It's sort of, you know, that's the outside is the wild, the untamed. And then inside here, you have this very tame, sleeping uh, boy. So it was just, I thought, a good contrast of how he felt about his son versus, you know, how he behaved out, outwardly towards other people. Yeah, and even like specifically within, um, you know, kind of the realm of the drawing itself, right? If you're going to characterize it, describe it in some way, uh, to the extent that, I mean, you're going to have to do some sort of recap, right, with any kind of acro acrostic uh, uh, poetry. Um, at the same time, right, you might want to do something what Jessica did here, right? So uh, let's just look at the beginning again a little bit. Perhaps the boy beneath his elder, there is a line break, reef. When carved, line break, into gentle slumber, right? So uh, much more in drawing, I think, than even uh, a lot of painting. Uh, well, maybe this this might apply also to something like Van Gogh's 
painting when you see just like a ton of like highly highly textured physical paint i don't know i don't know if people really have seen this i mean you could sort of look at this and uh you know if you go to like wiki art or something or like google art uh and you really zoom in on some van gogh paintings for instance you really see how physical it gets uh, when i was in amsterdam and i was at the uh van gogh museum and seeing some of those paintings uh, up close you really do appreciate the, the sheer kind of physicality of the paint, right? That you don't necessarily see in a two-dimensional image, especially if you don't mm. have like access to a very high resolution one. Um, but here, like, yeah. you know, in, in, in drawing, right? Uh, it, it makes sense, right? When we're talking about this uh, uh, carving, right? This, uh, uh, th this uh, face is almost carved in, right? Because you're going to need, right? Obviously in drawing, you're going to need this kind of like stark contrast, stark relief right whether it's in coloration or how uh um how fat maybe like the line is how dark the line is that mm -hmm. kind of thing right there's definitely this this uh sense that is being carved in um so you know to the extent that you're going to do any kind of like little recaps or whatever what's going on in in a drawing um to the extent that is happening just please mm -hmm. make it you know more interesting right make it make it sensual right we're all yeah. very sensual people uh, yeah. on this channel um so so if anything please us okay so anyway um maybe we could uh, move on to then okay. that's what i wrote this is what i was talking about this is the poem i wrote actually about that painting but it, you would not know it by uh unless i was telling you okay all right so um hmm. well i have some images of mariopol as well but i guess all right so this being this kind of like genesis right that the the genesis for uh, the poem in some ways but we could also i guess look at some of the let's just quickly look at some of the images right this is a pre-invasion mariopol right um if you actually look at some of the images of like pre uh 1995 96 battle of grozny uh war in chechnya uh, uh capital or grozny being the uh, capital of uh, chechnya um you know, it looks like this before, and then it looks like it like 10 years after when uh, Russia, um, in a kind of, you know, all, all nation states, right, do this propaganda move where mm. after uh, absolutely leveling a city, um, if you uh, decide to ally with the country after the fact and stay in their good graces, they will pour billions of dollars into rebuilding you and making you look good. But uh, so this is what it looks like before the invasion, All right, This is what... Uh, it's looking like uh, now. Oh, wow. All right. So yeah. this is what it looks Oh, sorry. No, that's not what it looks like now. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, um, but, but this kind of like, I guess, so we have those images and this being kind of like perhaps uh, the kernel, right? In the sense of like the, the uh, impetus, right? Before, like if the Mariupol images are things that, uh, give you uh, the sort of uh, a context for the poem. This, uh, I think, sort of spiritually gives what you're getting that in terms of that closeness and that hiding and the shadows, right? So uh, let me let me just read that poem. Uh, Mariopol. Never watercolor. The sky is oil on canvas. Into the green, look and reach. The lower branch leans. Is it she? hide from the soldier stars stay small abandoned clay cold hours overtake as branches bend and snap the sudden stone upon stone morning chill and morning spelled m-o-u-r-n-i-n-g nothing but mineral remains this gray earth tree where flesh rings bone Right. So a couple of things that I think are uh, interesting here. First of all, uh, the fact that, um, you know, we, we have this sort of backstory uh, uh, with these poems, this being a kind, the kind of like spiritual kernel, even if the other ones kind of more topically tell you what's going on. But even so, I mean, so if the genesis of this is, in fact, uh, what looks like to me from here, at least a watercolor, right uh, here, Jessica's poem says never watercolor. The sky is oil on canvas, right? Um, and you could sort of understand, right, this idea of oil on canvas, this kind of sharpness, 
right? Um, uh, I guess, I mean, you could do some, uh, a photo like this, for instance, uh, as a watercolor, but it seems like given what we have going on in terms of the starkness of the imagery, right, you maybe want some of that uh, Van Gogh quality that I mentioned with things just sort of, you know, maybe jumping out uh, of the canvas, just physically, right? Imagine almost like a tree mm -hmm. coming out just by the pure, pure physicality. You could reach out, you could physically touch mm -hmm. it, you could know what that texture is. Um, mm. And, you know, th th these are just some of the kinds of things that yeah. you want to think about well, when you're doing this, these kinds of poems. And the narr narrative here, like, you know, so I was thinking about a young girl, perhaps uh, the lower branch leans, is it she, hide from the soldier. So I, I like my impetus was thinking when I saw this painting and I, I thought, is someone hiding behind there? What kind of story could I create? And that's where I combined like what was going on, you know, in the contemporary world with the painting. And, and like I said, um, there's no, I don't reference the painting in the poem. No one would know that if I didn't say it, but uh, it's just an example of how, like I said earlier, you, you know, you want to set out to write one thing, but then it just doesn't work out that way. So um, it becomes something totally different. So yes, yep. it's actually kind of a bleak, a bleak poem, uh, something that's very, very, you know, lush, forests are lush, but then really this has, it goes from, you know, mentioning the green to something a little bending and snapping and stone and um, minerals and that, like that picture you show, just things are just sort of, you know, broken and um, a very more bleak depiction. So, mm -hmm. um, and I noticed your pronunciation is different. It is it's not Mariupol, it's Mariupol. Oh, I just in Russian, I've always heard of Mariupol. Okay. Um, and, you know, the actually the Ukrainian pronunciation might be a little bit uh, different too. I know okay. recently we've had the whole, you know, things like it should be spelled a certain way. So I'm not exactly sure uh, which one's uh, which, but it's just the way that I've always heard it. Mm hmm. And the way, at least, that I hear it when I when I listen to Russian propaganda radio um, on my uh, little mm -hmm. morning walks, uh, uh, state radio, uh, whenever they say mm -hmm. that, that's how they tend to pronounce it. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, maybe we could do uh, if I could choose one. Maybe we could do the the one the artist's father reading, the one where Cezanne's father. So since we did one on Cezanne's son, we could do mm -hmm. one now. Cezanne talking about his father. Okay. Well, the reason I thought it'd be an interesting to read this one, because, uh, you know, it's a sort of a bridge when you have, you had a son, you had a son. Now this is his father. And what I have always read about Cezanne was that he had a lot of, you know, resentment towards his father. And you get, I think his father was probably very controlling. He didn't think his son could do very much. And he always wanted him to be a, um, a banker or a lawyer. And he's like, why do you have to be a painter? And it's, it just shows you that even in the 1800s, they still didn't support artists. You know, family members were just like, why do you have to do this? So it's just so interesting how so little changes over the centuries. And when I, when I wrote this, that's what I focused on. So, you know, like I said, you look at this painting and you see just a man sitting in a chair, reading a newspaper, his legs are crossed. Um, and there's a painting in the background. It's probably, you know, it looks like it's pears. So he's probably one of his sons. And, that's all you could say about it. Or, you know, I go in a little further and I tell the narrative a bit about th his son and, and his feelings towards his father and uh, uh, how they didn't, you know, mesh well on these, they, they uh, butted heads, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So that's where the narrative I took. You want to read the poem? Okay, I will read it. Okay, so this poem is called uh, The Artist's Father Reading. Levemont, 1866. Dear Father, you are getting older. As mid-afternoon wearies, just where have those legs gone to? Cap and shoes and ankles crossed. Somewhere the wind dissolves into chair and you appear to leap, seated, a figure forms as you labor the gravel that grows the floral patterns that almost become part of you. Shadows garden the gray shades of misunderstanding. Green hues move where human colors befall. A painting of a painting aside some red door. It is a pair. It's better to become banker than painter, you said. Father, I do not begrudge. Image matters. It is a momentary triumph, 
a small grove at the end of one's concrete heart. Never approach. Turn the page whilst I wait the rush of your hurried hum. You know, one thing that first I appreciate about the uh, painting is um, I'm not exactly sure uh, at what stage this was in Cezanne's career, whether at this point he already started uh, maybe like, uh, uh, you know, winning his father over or like whatever it might be, or if this was like a, a forever thing in Cezanne's biography, I'm not exactly sure too much about his biography, but um, just with that bit of context, right? Uh, when you look at the painting, you start seeing his father. I, I mean, like his father, right, might be wealthy, right? He might have a uh, mm -hmm. leisure time, right? He might be, you know, this kind of like upper crust person, at the same time, when you look at this armchair uh, and, uh, you know, like whatever the flower pattern is, right, it's now just kind of this series of smudges. And uh, with the color altogether, right, it is, you know, it is very much like you use the word concrete in in the uh, um, you know, poem, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not in reference to the chair, but it, it could be, right? I mean, just kind of like you can implicitly sort of see where this is going. It's almost mm -hmm. as if like he is this kind of like stone figure, you know, this, yeah. archa this kind of like archaic figure that's sort of sitting there forever. It's this kind of like totally, you know, almost like ruined chair. You know, if anything, mm -hmm. like a lot, a lot of this concrete, you know, might look like very much like it's covered in bird droppings, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, he doesn't look very comfortable to be honest, because yeah, he's exactly. not leaning back. He's not leaning back. That's what I mean. He says, I, I say he appears to leap. It's almost like he's trying to look to get up or, or not, but he's not leaning in it. It's like his legs are crossed. So he looks relaxed down below, but up above, he just, um, it doesn't look like a very comfortable position because he's just sitting there like that. And, and so I just think that's an interesting angle he did. I mean, mm -hmm. um, it says a lot kind of, I think, you know, about his father and in, in that, in that regard. And, uh, yeah. but again, that's where I go with the narrative. I take some aspects of his own life and how he felt about his father. And I imbue that into the poem. And so like, you know, he says image, image matters. It is a momentary triumph, you know, and mm -hmm. that's what image is, but really what he says, you know, um, what's more important, the image of the moment or the long term of, you know, being known as the artist and the, the painter who Cezanne made very little money in his lifetime. And, and then, you know, what, what really matters. And it's all just a matter of perspective. And, uh, I think, you know, one person's going to have their right answer and the other one's going to say, no, I'm right. But ultimately it's like, who is his father to tell him? Well, no, you have to live your life like this. I mean, you know, his son, his, his son chose to be a painter and, uh, you know, and, and that's that. And, and I, I think people rely too much I th in the momentary image. They say, oh, okay, I got all these images of success and this and that. So clearly I was right. And you're like, well, were you, you know, I mean, maybe you're right in that moment, but there's more than a moment, right. To decide things, I think. And, you know, and, and that ultimately, that yeah. And that line uh, dissolves into chair and you, uh, line break, appear to leap. Um, there, there's also like another reading, right, uh, that you appear, right, you physically now uh, are materializing in, or, in order to leap, right? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like leaping in that sense in a more abstracted sense of whatever that might mean, right, in terms of uh, his life. Right, uh, his life in yeah. reference to his uh, his son's life. Right, there's different kinds of readings that you could make uh, based off of that. Um, and obviously, as you could see, like not <coughs> not not every uh, a poem has um, a, uh, a you know a, a Landon type figure. Right, oftentimes you yeah you know you stay within the universe of the poem, even though like obviously like uh, uh, you know having Cezanne himself you know do essentially this this letter. Uh, uh, to his father, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is obviously like, you know, exiting whatever uh, that, that past constraint is and mm -hmm. sort of, again, like adding your own, I mean, like another, another thing that I, you know, uh, when I, when we're talking about making uh, this kind of poetry interesting, that it's not just a recap of the painting, you know, this, it's just literally a letter to the father, 
Right. And it's called um, uh, Cezanne's father reading. Well, he's literally yeah. reading in the p- painting, but mm-hmm. is he reading? It can be referencing the letter mm-hmm. that he's reading this letter that he said. And, and that the letter is fictitious. Obviously I wrote that, but, uh, but yes, uh, more so like what, what you said, just, just kind of, uh, going and 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 going with an organic feel and it's like if the landon character didn't fit in i'm not gonna force him in it just it didn't you know it, it's just where where it was needed where he was needed or whatever and um that's another thing to keep in mind like don't try to shoehorn everything in simply for a pattern or simply because of this or that that's like when i wrote this i mean that's why i said poems on french painters paintings and nature since not all the paintings most of them are french all of them are most of, if not, and then, um, you know, paintings, Hilmoff, Clint is obviously not French, but that, that falls under a different category. And I just kind of went with, you know, what, what, uh, made that impression upon me at that time. So why don't we uh, move on to this, uh, painting by, uh, Camille, uh, Pissarro, um, there's actually okay. two two versions of it that I want people to see. Right here's one. Here's another. I'm not exactly sure because you know oftentimes uh, when you look at different paintings, uh, they they do look uh, pretty mm. different, uh, even if it's the same painting, depending on how it's captured. Yep. But this almost seems like a different material, right? This uh, one here mm-hmm. is just much more uh, textured. Here, um, I mean, they both uh, appear like they're uh watercolors but um this one kind of like much yeah. maybe much more so but i the, the I, one I, that that's the one i based it on like in terms of the image that i recall the, the one that's know, up right but, now yeah yeah um yeah so let, let, let's say with that and also i i prefer this one anyway i just want people to uh, uh observe some of those differences and by the way audio podcast listeners spotify apple google podcasts podbean wherever they you are um, it's not too late to just switch over to the video um, and stop seething, right? Stop seething as you're going on your walk thinking, fuck, I'm missing everything because you are, right? So, <laughs> you know, you know what, you know what, finish the audio and then rewatch it on, on YouTube as well. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe we could talk about uh, this a little bit. Uh, do you want to okay. read the, the, the uh, yes. poem first? Yes, I will read it. So this one uh, is based on this painting. And again, I haven't looked over it, so forgive if I stutter a bit. Okay. Voices, voices, violins. Landon Marvel's Pissarro. Aware that voices can falter when juxtaposed aside another, similar can be said of color. Blue beside green can alter the eye's internal creature. Perception. Is it a cat that leans in to smell the flower or a bird flying out some higher order? A decade older and patient with his follower that too soon he came to admire. You are a greater painter than I, he spoke to Cezanne, thus rendering himself lesser. The landscapes of Monet and Renoir remain eerily similar. Yet, what of your shadow, Pissarro, your grace and craft, understated and eloquent, perhaps. Your kind words, a painting is not someone similar. The horse and carriage remain. The approach to the village of voices, your trees rise into calm. Serene they are as some violin or the palms that otherwise violently shake in wind. So the little backstory about Pissarro is that he's actually a really, really nice guy. He was probably an Enneagram 9. He was a very calm, um, kind-hearted person. He's one of the few people who could uh, put up with uh, Cezanne's, quote, prickly personality. And he had, you know, he was, you know, he had no problem saying, hey, you're a greater painter than I am. Like, he wasn't uh, ostentatious like that. And so um, he... I was paying him some due because for a long time, I, you know, I, I think Pizarro is quite a good painter. I, I don't think he's at the highest level as the others. And I think he knew that. Obviously, he said that to Cezanne. It's noted that he said that. Um, but he's he's a very, like, I'm, I'm evoking his calm, the serenity, and then uh, 
is a violin or, you know, or the palms. Now this could be tree palms or hands that otherwise violently shake and wind. So uh, he's a bit of a contrast to the artistic personality. He did not have that. And um, so, so that's sort of the backstory about that. Well, did you uh, intentionally uh, choose this painting because of the word uh, wassons? Because I'm not sure if uh, you picked up on this, but when I was looking this up, it seems as if it means neighbors. Oh, like the yeah. village of neighbors. Well, but, but but I mean, of course, that 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 idea, right? That warmth uh, corresponds nicely to yeah. what you just described. Um, even like you know, within the poem itself, right? There's like allusions to things that you could sort of take away in that way, you know. Yeah, and the title is obviously very Wallace Stevensian like. It's a nod to Stevens. There's a lot of nods to Stevens throughout this whole collection, whether mm -hmm. or not you see it. I mean, that's just, you know, obviously he's someone who's a, a paint, uh, I almost said painter, painter of words. Um, that I, but I was like, it gave me the idea of the title. So even before writing the poem, I say, oh, this would be a good title. And so, um, you know, that's, that's where I, where I went with that. And then again, another example, using some biographical stuff, using what could be happening in this painting. I mean, there's another angle. You could have taken what's going on in that, you know, carriage or the horse. Is it a couple, you know, just sitting in there calmly? Are they arguing? And given that it's Pissarro, I would, you know, likely think it would be more of a calming, soothing kind of quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so that's just just another type of uh, just a contrast from from some of the other painters. Uh, do, you, do you want to talk about uh, Viv Vivian uh, Meyer a little bit? OK, I could do one. So I have a handful of poems that I, I wrote on uh, some women artists and Vivian Meyer is one of them. And uh, those who don't know, Vivian Meyer is was a uh, photographer who was discovered after her death. They did a documentary on her called Finding Vivian Meyer. And basically all her thousands of photos were found. And she was mostly doing street photography. And her photos really do, a lot of them look like painters. She uses a lot of, um, she captures real life moments. Um, and uh, she, you know, she just has this, uh, very, you know, like I said, a very active kind of street quality to her to her work, um, and and that's what I was um, what what I was just wanting to write about her. I was I always wanted to do, and and she's also known for doing like the title of the poem is self portrait. She did a number of self portraits, and uh, I actually I really enjoy a lot of her self portraits. Some of them are more interesting than others, but she wasn't. She just showed she wasn't afraid to. Um, you know, show herself. They all say, oh, she was a recluse. And yeah, I mean, she was, but what they don't know is like, yeah, she took a lot of photos of self-portraits. And she also, what they don't know is that she did actually send off some photos to Life magazine and such, and they rejected them as they always do, you know, of any great artist. And then, and then they're like, oh, why? You know, anyway, so it always irritates me then after the fact they people jump on the bandwagon you know but whatever <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll add some of the pictures uh, of her um later on as uh, things are scrolling and maybe we'll uh, uh have some of these scrolling images uh as we're reading the poem right so it's called self-portrait for vivian meyer right and self-portrait obviously she uh, uh you know she uh she had different kinds of photographs, including self-portraits. Mm -hmm. If you look at when I when I did the photography show, uh, the first one rather with with uh, Joel Parrish, who himself is a photographer, right? He mentioned how her own style of self-portraits, um, you know, have now become you know pretty trite in the hands of tons of like modern photographers who are just sort of like you know throwing stuff together. Mm -hmm. um, Right. So this self-portrait, right? Uh, it could, you know, it could be almost as if Jessica herself is uh, looking at a self-portrait that uh, Vivian Meyer made and is after that. Or it might be a self-portrait uh, meaning of uh, the poet herself. Um, it could be various, you know, combinations uh, dipping in and out of different kinds of meaning like this. Mm -hmm. Um, right. So that's, uh, uh, you know, you always, that's another thing, right? You always obviously want a multiplicity of, uh, of meaning. So self-portrait for Vivian Meyer. 
Small doll, memory frills the gentle hush of rain. Cascading temperatures promised drop and yet do not. No one cures the pithiest gesture, falling almost tender upon a face. Laced in Laura Ashley nightly, somewhere this occasion and I, a bystander in sleep, explore the nocturne years later. Who is she? Thrust into uproar, eventual stars drip the upside down hour. No painter can undo what shadow grows within her glass roliflex. Solemn street feet held by gray shoes. Um, obviously, you know, touching upon uh, some of the elements of, uh, um, you know, of Vivian Meyer herself. Did, did, mm-hmm. did, w- w- was she wearing uh, Laura Ashley? No, clothes? no, no, no. That is me. That's that's imbuing myself. But also I had an image of there's that one photo where it's like a little girl with a, I think she's like in a car and she's got looks like she has lace on. And so that was just uh, my own thing. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I have actually a Laura Ashley nightgown. So uh, that's where you say talking about myself. I kind of yes, I do kind of write myself a bystander in sleep, you know, and then um, but uh, th- that's where it could be kind of read multiple ways, but I'm surprised you knew that what that was. Most people don't. Uh, especially yeah, I don't, guys. I don't, I, I, I don't. I don't know how uh, well I. I am in touch with my feminine side, as you all know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't. I actually don't know how I knew that. But uh, I. But also, I mean, you know that my head is filled with all kinds of random fucking trash, right? So yeah. Um. Well, it's also not yes. Surprising. Aha, uh-huh, yes. No, but so, so, um, again, uh, yes. So when I'm referencing that, I say, Lace and Laura Ashley Knightley, somewhere this occasion, and I, a bystander in sleep, that's, I am referring to myself. Uh, explore the nocturne years later, who is she? Um, so look, it can be me, the, the speaker, the I, looking at the Vivian Meyer poem, but also asking, who is she? Uh, um, a lot of, and then uh, imbuing in that whole, like, uh, evoking the whole, um, the, the gray shoes, the gray paint, uh, her paintings are black and white. And so, you know, the street, the black and white, um, lots of, you know, she has a lot of her, uh, uh, pictures of herself where she's looking at herself in a mirror or there's glass behind her. So I was just, um, yeah, those were some, just some of the images that came to mind. So Going back to the title, self-portrait can be self-portrait for Vivian Meyer, but also self-portrait within my, my the speaker, the eye. You know, it has some layering there, like a mirror yeah. and a mirror kind of thing. And, and to get in this kind of like dual biography sort of uh, uh, idea, right? I mean, obviously, we're starting with small doll. Uh, Vivian Meyer, she was a nanny, right? This is something that could be very much you know, around her environment. Um, you know, this idea of small doll. Uh, you know, like a classic reference, right? Something like, you know, Ibsen's uh, A Doll's House, right? This idea of uh, a woman being nothing more essentially than than a doll, right? If you are a, a great artist, right, and you feel somehow shafted by society, right, you could easily um, imagine yourself being perceived in that way, right? Uh, a, a line like cascading temperatures promise to drop and yet do not right this could be uh, a childhood sickness it could be um you know a reference to to something else right uh i immediately sort of had the association with childhood sickness because later on it says no one cures the pithiest gesture right this 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 idea that there needs to be something uh, almost like physically corrected um and obviously right the who is she right question mark uh that is you know that is a reference to any kind of uh obscure artist right could be vivian meyer who was uh only discovered uh, after her death uh it could be any living writer or painter or photographer or anybody right that um is in a similar situation um lines like uh, what shadow no, no painter can undo what shadow grows within her, right? Uh, either, you know, you, you could uh, consider this a kind of like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say it's like a diss uh, to 
painting, right? But just this kind of idea that um, even in the future, if there's this kind of uh, adulation and you're not around to witness it for yourself, um, you might be, you know, you might be happy at the fact that it's coming, but if you don't get to witness it, uh, you have sort of lived your life therefore, right, uh, uh, without that, that kind of yeah. experience, which is always a well, negative. And there's also that kind of thing where when photography first became available, there's all, there was the painters were thinking, oh, God, they're, you know, they, they're going to throw us out of business or something like that. Like, you won't need a painter now with a photographer. But um, but we can see how they're they're not the same thing. You know, one doesn't need or one does not, you know, exclude the other. We need both mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah, again, another image, another image, uh, artist, um, they were all either the, the image artist, some kind of, um, yeah. All right. So last couple of poems, right? So, um, Helma F. Clint, uh, was a, uh, she was Swedish, right? She was a Swedish, mm -hmm. uh, artist. Uh, yes. She was sort of, uh, I guess, I, I yeah, don't know Swedish. if you say, you, does it say abstract? Like, so her works were somewhat abstract. And I, I found out about her. Similarly, how I found out about Vivian Meyer was seeing a documentary on Criterion. Now, did you get to watch that? Have you seen uh, that? On uh, Helma? Yeah. It's on. Um, I, I don't, actually, them. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. So that's where, that's where I watched it. And I thought it was really uh, an interesting uh, documentary and it was mostly i really thought her swan series was very interesting and how over time they get become more and more abstract to the point where they just like look look like two circles mm -hmm. you know sort of rolling in together and that's kind of an example of where something that's a series I, I think is really interesting because when you take it into a context you're like oh that's really interesting but on its own it might not seem so amazing kind of thing mm -hmm. uh so, yeah, she has she has a lot of really interesting. And then she used to supposedly she'd do these huge canvases, and she would do them on the floor, and she'd do them barefoot. And um, so, yes, yeah, she was another one who kind of got discovered after her death, and and that sort of thing. So again, if you notice a theme in this book, it's a lot of people who are overlooked. Gee, I wonder why I connect with that. Um. What, what, what do you think about, because uh, I'm not sure if this was mentioned in the documentary, but I I do know that in her life, she did say something like after her death, um, she wanted, she, <laughs> all right, this, it's not going to let me do it. All right. Um, she did want to, uh, I'm not sure what resentments she had or whatever, but she wanted like only 20 years after her death for all this stuff to be revealed. Um, mm. and I, I found that to be an interesting, uh, detail simply because, you know, maybe she did feel that if she were somehow, uh, like totally ignored, right. In her lifetime, maybe she understood, okay, well, if I'm ignored now, there is probably going to be some sort of lag mm -hmm. between my death to, you know, going back to this idea of the Leonard Schlein, uh, kind of like model of art where, uh, the artist presages, wider discoveries in and about the world by, you know, at least uh, a couple of decades or more. Um, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm just thinking like, did she think like, all right, it, it might take a couple of decades for people to appreciate this, uh, whether it's like, you know, the, the, the actual kind of nature of the contribution or as, uh, as simple as, mm -hmm. you know, like with the recent death of a Bruce Ario, right. Um, this idea that you are, dangerous you're harmful while you're alive but after you're dead maybe then we could start celebrating you because uh if if you know uh, of course we're never going to say this explicitly but if we're going to be out there you know saying things about you positive or negative um you're not going to be around to yeah. correct the record right which makes you mm -hmm. safe right we could then yep. use you for our own purposes and it's interesting how like all these things play out psychologically dynamically right in ways that people wouldn't even be thinking about i mean people uh mm -hmm. do that all the time right they operate under those assumptions under those psychological uh conditions without even realizing yeah. what they're doing 
Yeah, um, and I say they say, you know, when you're dead, you're no threat and people start to view you differently. And the more, you know, as time goes on, you're no you're no longer a uh, competition. And so then yeah. they start to look at you, uh, you know, so there's always that. There's always that. Yeah, that's definitely something that kind of plays into the poems. Uh, d- do you want to read uh, your poem? Yeah. Okay. So this poem, um, as Alex mentioned, is on Hilma Af Klint, the painter, and she was a Swedish painter. So her, excuse me, this title is called Her Sweden for Hilma Af Klint. Two nebulous, they said, upon sight of her swan series, laid bare, perhaps her neck is delicate, circular, or rather, might it lean in to thirst? How to shape and slide across water, become the bird now marred by some other eye? She pieces, wing to wing, her Sweden, where from afar appears predatory. Youth is arduous, even memory contains questions. The garden imposes imperfections and galvanizes leaf by prayer for leaf. This blue, ill-got moon, upholding nocturne, she descends to glide, brush the floor. Canvases do not include circumference and nor in circumstance conform. Yeah, so I mean, this touches upon uh, all the things that uh, you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, There's uh, obviously... Yeah. The, sorry, the nonconformist, the yeah. nonconformist, um, you know, basically, yes. And, and some references, obviously, uh, the swan, a little reference to Rilke, a little nod to Rilke is in there. Um, but yes, I, I say upholding nocturne. She descends to glide, you know, brushing the floor, meaning she is on the floor. Literally, she painted on the floor, many of her paint, big, large canvases. So it it, it kind of um, plays out pretty factually. Uh, but, um, but yes, it is about sort of, you know, doing something different and, um, uh, the, the whole circular idea of the swan and how they, it, not just literally their necks, but as, as if, it, when the series goes on, they actually do meld and they become like a big circle. They become like a, like, if I recall, like two colors just melded together, which is really interesting, you know? And as I said, in the context, that really that really adds something versus just alone, um, you know. So, yeah, it yeah. was like that one. Yeah, and I mean, looking for strategies right here for uh, people that are watching this who might be poets uh, themselves or trying to be poets. Um, you know, like li- little things how uh, in this poem, Jessica is identifying uh the uh artist herself with the swans in different ways you know uh these are uh, definite identifications do tend to shift right as the poem goes on you could also see you know some uh identification uh uh between swan artist and also the narrator and mm-hmm. then more widely you know the, the the poet herself here you know quite literally um and again, the, the, these are things that that you want to focus on, and you know it could often be as simple as choosing a set of images. If you're going to be doing this kind of poetry, maybe choose uh, a set of images or paintings or whatever that uh, more naturally lend themselves to kind of seeing outside, right? These kinds of perspectives where uh, you don't naturally just want to just go straight into like I don't know, um, discussing uh just just you know the image uh, for the sake of the image right you image for the sake of the image that. or or just always fall back on politics or what you think is just what people want you to say or safe things to say and not not have an experiment with words i mean part of the thing with this book is you know if you're going to write poems on on paintings you should have some color in your words be colorful with your words think of you know have some good sounds have some good imagery uh not just you know a flat flatness on the canvas, but something that elevates. And, um, you know, I, I speak about a lot of that within here, just uh, kind of, you know, rising above and elevating and, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. To, uh, uh, you know, speaking of politics, um, you know, like in the Mariupol poem, right, it's, uh, uh, um, you know, obviously, it's like, it's like a political poem in a sense that it's discussing uh, contemporary events, right? But not in a way that 
it doesn't even necessarily uh, take a position. Like I, I'm actually thinking of uh, with a bunch of poems that I'm doing now, maybe eventually having some sort of like Russia Ukraine series. But mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you don't want to. Maybe we're going to talk about this a bit more. I'll flush it out for the bonus show, guys. There's going to be we're going to do one more po- poem now, but before that, okay, right? There's going to be a, a, a bonus show for the patrons mm-hmm. where we're going to discuss mm-hmm. uh, searching for Sugar Man. It's a, a 2012 documentary on the classic artist speaking of an overlooked artist this is yeah. another overlooked uh, yeah. artist Six, Six, Sixto Rodriguez I never heard him, him until uh, no. I was alerted to the existence of this documentary uh, excellent singer excellent uh, oh, songwriter oh yes isn't he I'm like I've been missing out on this I totally dig his music I'm like total Spotify now yeah uh, I only listened uh, I listened to his first album this morning on my walk and uh, half of the second one so I'm gonna have to do mm-hmm. a couple of re-listens but so far uh, mm-hmm. I enjoy what I heard we're gonna talk and, about and he is, too so he is a good example like his his songs do tend to have some political you know bent to them but again that can work but it's not just the politics whenever you make it just the politics or just the intent and there's no like art or skill to fall back on you're dating your work i mean there's no greater expiration date than that you know yeah. i mean you know people can you go back and you can read drum taps from you know about the civil war that whitman wrote and it's as fresh as it was written because there's quality inherently within the work it's it's literary value but if all you're going to do is just you know um just tell the obvious and just say oh you know this was bad or that was bad or yay whatever i mean who cares in the long run mm-hmm. you have to make something stick and that's why we keep coming back to these paintings or these these ideas because mm-hmm. they're universal they bring us back yeah so uh, we'll talk about that we'll talk about um maybe some uh some of my own poetry that i'm working on some of the stuff that you guys have been seeing on this channel some of the stuff i'm going to do later um mm. more uh uh we all we we'll always need a few jessica center topics so we'll do some of those as well um yeah i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna start littering the little passive aggressive snipes to make up for the email what let's listen it's fine it's fine this is entertaining right you, like that's the thing <laughs> you, you you don't see like you don't see uh enough bickering you know, between artists publicly, right? You're not supposed to do that. The only type of <laughs> bickering that you see between artists right now is, um, you know, it's shit like someone does a Twitter thread, like, actually, this young adult writer, she's actually very racist, and here's why, right? That's that's the extent that you get. And it's not interesting. There's no actual psychological dynamism there outside, you know, here's one social climber uh, fighting to the bloody death uh, with another social climber. I mean, who cares, uh-huh. right? It's the same yeah. old perennial theme. So anyway, to close this out, we're going to do uh, a final poem. Um, one of the last poems in the collection, right? It's not uh, based on any uh, painting. Um, it's titled Before the Artist. Oh, um, okay. I'm going to do that one. Okay. Yeah. yeah yes, and, I mean- and, and, yeah, it's and yeah, before the artist, right? I mean, just like immediately just think about uh uh the title, right? The all the mm-hmm. like just in the context of the book, right? Before the mm-hmm. artist. What what can it mean, right? It could mean yeah. standing physically before an artist as you're painted. It could be before the point of becoming an artist, right? There's different I'll, always think about titles as uh potential variations in ways that are unexpected. You always gotta do mm-hmm. that. So maybe mm-hmm. you could you could read yeah. that for us. So I was going to say this poem is actually based on a real picture of me. So um, I don't have the picture, unfortunately. I didn't think to. It's it's just a, okay. Basically, it's a picture of me, and I'm holding my cat, and I'm nine years old, and I'm wearing my school uniform, and I go, oh, this is interesting, and um, so you have now now I'm writing a poem about a picture about that was taken of me so here's myself um anyway so before the artist unpeace this uniform forced into wear stripes and all and wrinkled from the day i am nine and will remain into eve worn much akin to an apron when no one is looking years later someone asks to leave another under undervalued night arrives Find me. There are many dwelling into occasion. 
And uh, so when I was reading this, uh, um, immediately, you know, some of those uh, attentions uh, sprang to mind. First, the title that I mentioned, right, the two different ways you can interpret it. Jessica's telling us about uh, this being based on an image of her. Obviously, you know, um, uh, we, we should uh, always sort of treat text as text and uh, mm-hmm. uh, understand it you know, as it is. It's nice to have that additional context, but, um, you know, it's it's not context that should ever make or break a poem right mm-hmm. one thing that i often say is like there's a lot of like modern art that is way too uh reflexive right in the sense that it is so dependent on all these surroundings that you know as soon as circumstances change and l- illusions change then it no longer works you mm-hmm. don't want that so okay mm-hmm. first we have the title um so unpeace this uniform forced into wear stripes and all and wrinkled from the day, right? Um, the day being, you know, it could be, uh, uh, it could be just kind of like uh, whatever happened during that day. It could be any, you know, it could be any given mm. day. Uh, mm-hmm. There is this kind of odd specificity that you get, right, where the narrator says, um, "I am nine and will remain into Eve." Right? This could very well be, right, uh, the day before her birthday, right, before she mm. turns ten, right. That is a possible reading right um years later someone asks to leave another undervalued night arrives right night being you know something that uh it could be scared of it could be misunderstood it could be Mm -hmm. something that uh, might not have any of the negative connotations it could simply be something that ought to be you know, unpeeled. I'm not sure how uh, kids mm-hmm. feel about the night these days, but when I was nine, 10 years old and I was, uh, I remember my grandma used to really hate when I would stay out until like 10 or 11 sometimes mm-hmm. uh, in, in, in Brooklyn uh, in the 90s. Um, but it was, you know, night was like this totally nice and mysterious thing with your friends. And, uh, uh, when you could have that at somewhere and still be out and, you know, know that you're not supposed to be out there, right? Uh, there's all these mm-hmm. like secrets underneath. Um, this is exactly what a child might, might think of in the future. But as an adult, right? If you're an artist and you maintain that sort of childlike curiosity, you're going to also have some of those feelings. So, mm-hmm. um, and obviously the ending find me there are many dwelling into occasion right there are others perhaps just like her right uh, maybe not contemporaneously maybe in the past maybe in the future right i always tell people if you have any kind of audience in mind whether you're an mm-hmm. artist or whether you're a charity worker or you're a political activist always remember the only audience that's worth a damn for you to ever think about is an audience that is yet to be born. Okay. Don't think about mm-hmm. the, Don't, don't, don't. Cause if you're thinking about the present day, you're just trying to please a bunch of chimps, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, any, yep. you know, uh, cause, cause just, that's just how things tend to go. But anyway, I yeah. guess uh, we could sort of end. I was going to say, can we say that we're, if they want to purchase this, Oh yeah, I mean it's going to be in the show notes. Yeah. Right. First of all, why yeah. why does my cover look a little different from yours? Um, mine has a watermark on it because when oh, it's, okay, a, it's just a, it's just a watermark. It's basically when you if you publish a book, you can get a very cheap version, like two dollars, just to physically see it. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's not for resale. So, um, yes. Yeah. So I was going to say the Kindle is four ninety nine, but the paperback is six ninety nine, and I recommend people get the paperback, even though I make more money on the Kindle. Who cares about that? Honestly, having a physical copy of a poetry collection is much better than I think having a Kindle. But um, it is a nice quality book, and there's lots of indenting and it's different from word shapes which word shapes was a collection so it was a you know a comp- 10 years of poems all together and but this is being a book so this goes more in a synergy interdependent on each other more so than that collection but again they're different so uh yeah and like uh, hopefully i'd like to you know someday finish another finish more ideas for this kind of thing and um see where it goes but yes i was like what? Wait, what? how come i just right now saw a thumb go up that uh, was weird uh maybe it somebody was a, like may- that maybe it was a penis 
All right, guys, uh, if you want, all right, if you, if you like where this is going, patreon.com slash automachination, you get the bonus show where, you know. I'm going to have uh, a little bit of bubbly. I'm just letting you know. I'm just going to have a little bit of bubbly. See, see you should have told me because my weed box is locked. Uh, oh, it's not, it's just, not, it's, it's not opening a until later. It's, it's, it's not, right. it's not, hot. it's fluffy. Right. Um, so, so we're going to, so, okay. So, uh, patrons, uh, uh, if you're a patron, you're going to get this bonus show. We're going to have a bunch of stuff to talk about. It might be more or less, I'd say around the, the length of this show. So thank you for watching like subscribe and we'll see you again soon.